This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. Welcome to Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MD Edge Hematology Oncology. I'm Nick Andrews. I'm joined this week, as I always am, by the editor-in-chief of MD Edge Heme Onc, Dr. David Henry. Dr. Henry, so we've been talking about this COVID thing week after week after week after week, and it feels like every week we're getting to the point where someone says, okay, now it's about to get, a, you know, now it's about to become a big deal. So how are things where you are in uh, central Philadelphia? Yeah, so um, I think we can say yet again that now it's about to become a big deal, and maybe the peak is coming to Philadelphia. Of course, I'm speaking only for my city and those listening around the country and possibly around the world. It's very different depending on where you are, but I think living in the shadow of New York, we, we got the idea of what was going wrong fast, and I think Philadelphia may be adhering very well to what we're supposed to do, masking, mm-hmm. social distancing, being careful with hand washing, all these things you're supposed to do, I think we might be doing. And while well, each day we're getting reports in the city, uh, in particular my institution at Penn, the number is rising. They're not rising as steeply as they were worried. So, so a slight piece of good news here. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, you and I, of course, both live in Philadelphia, which is happenstance, of course. And I noticed that while things happen in New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and specifically Philadelphia as a major neighboring municipality, took it very seriously, very quickly, and. The goal, of course, is to have this not be really noticeable, to make it seem like we overreacted. I will say, though, that we neighbor New Jersey. That state maybe didn't do as much, so uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I know that in, in this city there are gymnasiums and hotels that are being repurposed, so a bunch of different things happening. Yeah. And, and on that note, we have at MDS Dermatology, uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network, uh, new recommendations for non-urgent skin cancer that is not melanoma on what to treat and surgery and, and using checkpoint inhibitors instead of recommending surgery at this time. You can find that in the show notes. You can also find it at mdh.com slash dermatology if uh, you see melanoma patients. Um, but that kind of thing, rescheduling surgeries, doing different stuff, it's, it's really important at this time. Absolutely. Uh, all the urgent stuff is what all we're doing right now to take care of this incredible epidemic and then what can wait is waiting. Absolutely. So let's talk about our guest tonight. First, we want to mention that Dr. Alana Yurkowitz, like many out there, is uh, too busy to do our show this week. So uh, we hope to hear from her soon. But so there will be no clinical correlation tonight or in the foreseeable future. A couple of weeks, we'll see how it goes. And, you know, we everybody's got to prioritize it. It seems like this is the time when uh, people are prioritizing specifically in healthcare. But let's talk about our, our interview guest, Dr. Nargis Duma. And we're talking all about lung cancer in the in the age of COVID. Yes, yeah, so this was a most interesting interview. She's at uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and a thoracic uh, medical thoracic oncology specialist. And we began, like I think we're going to begin most of these weeks until it's over, with COVID issues and uh, what it's like practicing for her. Because I've said on a couple of podcasts now, for, like for me, inpatient, outpatient, and teaching. And so one, and she goes through all of that. And one of the images that struck me was she said, uh, it's lonely. Uh, she sees in the hospital, as a young attending, she's in there, they're trying to keep a senior attending like me out of the hospital. And so she makes her rounds and leaves, but there's not as many attendings around because they get in and get out and there's not as many house staff around and not as many people around. And so that's different and lonely. And the, the next image was she noticed she's gowned and gloved and the patients are gloved and, and gowned and everybody's separate from everybody. And she's looking over her glasses at a patient lying in bed and talking about his cancer. And she saw the loneliness and the fear in his eyes that, you know, not being able to be uh, looking at each other in street clothes or usual clothes and with families. So that was an image I hadn't thought of. And then I couldn't resist or miss the opportunity to ask her some specific thoracic oncology questions on how would you treat this or that patient, mostly the the non-driver mutated straightforward metastatic non-small cell lung cancer patient in the era of chemo plus immuno-oncology. And of course, she's expert at that and answered those very well. So one one thing that this reminded me of was that, um, I said one thing that this reminded me of is that I I, I got this opinion when I was an undergrad or something that 
For some reason in the 21st century, we all feel as if history has stopped being made, as if World War II and the Civil War and Napoleon was something that happened long ago. And we hadn't had an event like this to remind us that we're just a part of the timeline like everybody else. And I, I can't imagine the sobriety of that realization when a clinician and a patient who used to be friendly and in a relationship are now looking at one another like we have to protect ourselves and we have to protect each other. So what a harrowing image that is. And I'll tell you what's, what struck me as well, because I'm a senior clinician, I have some perspective looking back in Philadelphia during Legionnaires, I'm intubating people in the VA, happened to be a resident then, and you know, what's the matter with these men? I didn't know. Then when HIV came out, and remember, we didn't know what it was, and these men were dying around us with a certain demographic, and I remember an attending saying to me, you're not going to touch them, are you? And of mm. course, in retrospect, that's almost uh, PC incorrect. It is yeah, incorrect. Sure. And we didn't know then. And, um, and now this era of especially young clinicians in training is facing the same thing. One new thing, though, um, I was talking to our all house staff residencies usually have one or two residents, the social chairs, to be sure this, there's a lighter side that um, you can be sure not to know all work and no play. And so with cell phones and the ability to take pictures constantly, you know, how about documenting what you're going through, mm -hmm. uh, the heavy moments, the lighter moments. And so they've set up an Instagram page at our hospital and we attendings over in the office or quickly making rounds. We're making some photos as well. And so we can look back on what we went through and remember it uh, as it should, as you just said, in perspective. And the, our, this is our generation's amazing episode. Yeah, it really is a once in a lifetime. I just read an article that a teacher was suggesting that students, you know, do your classwork if you can from home, but keep a journal. You're going to want to remember this. I think kids and grandkids are going to want to talk about this for a, well, a long time. A, a one more funny thing before we go to our podcast. My daughter's a first grade teacher, and mm. of course, schools are closed here in, in many uh, states, and of course, here in um, Northeast and in Philadelphia area, and she teaches first grade. So, of course, these six-year-olds are born with chips in their head, and so she continues <laughs> teaching them, and they all have... Um, it's either Zoom or a platform similar to it. Mm -hmm. And she mutes them so that when she's doing the first of the day, what she calls morning meeting, they can't chime in. Well, they've all figured out how to get around that. And wow. she starts talking and all of a sudden they start lighting up and answering. And she says, how do you do that? You know, I put you on mute. So um, <laughs> the, the budding generation uh, coming up from first grade uh, and rising um, will make us proud with all this technology that even now, they're learning how to use and possibly abuse it. I know. And of course, I mean, you just remind us that everything's going to be okay. I, you know, just another reminder that you, you, Dr. Henry, you survived what the bubonic plague, the Spanish flu. So we're going to be, okay. Oh, yeah, that was yeah, mean. I'm so yeah, sorry. I was a, yes. <laughs> I've been around for a long time. <laughs> yes. You were, so you were there we'll, at the hundred years war. Like, we'll, like yeah, all yeah. of us. okay. So let's, let's get to our interview with Dr. Nargis Duma. You're listening to blood and cancer, the official podcast of MD edge hematology. Oncology. And we can watch us on our show notes on our MD edge.com slash hematology dash oncology webpage for this episode with the show notes or those preceding it. And we hope you enjoy this one. I think you will. Welcome to this podcast. I'm Dr. David Henry, your host today on Blood and Cancer, the podcast you're listening to airing every Thursday morning on uh, iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, hoping to bring you interesting articles and discussions with thought leaders in various areas of cancer and hematology each week. And today I'm delighted to be talking to Dr. Nargist, who we're going to call NJ, uh, Dr. Nargist Duma who is at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. She's an assistant professor in the medicine department there and also a specialist in thoracic medical oncology. And in particular, she'll tell us how she seems to do a lot of female thoracic oncology. So NJ, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Dr. Henry. I'm glad to get to know you and to talk a little bit more about our new normal. Likewise. So let's get right into that. I'm sure, um, sadly, when this airs a week or two from our recording, it'll be in the month of April, and we will all be still dealing with this. Um, hopefully, the surge is not what's coming, but that's what they tell us. Um, so let's talk about our new normal. I thought we might cover three kinds of new normal, how you're handling inpatient, how you're handling outpatient, and teaching. And we can bounce back and forth on how that's different now that we have to deal with this this virus and the social distancing and all the 
hoops we have to jump through to make not uh, spread to ourselves or to our patients. So how about your inpatient? Are you rounding inpatient? How's that different at your teaching institution? So I have I have to say I was very anxious about starting inpatient. I just finished um, and I started last week. Um, I was more anxious when I was, wasn't was in than when I started. You know, the unknown is very difficult. Yeah. We are using masks, face shields, our white coats are no longer allowed, and we're all wearing scrubs. Um, exactly the same here. I think it has very, very difficult, like during my first day in inpatient, I have to have a few in a life conversations and patients are not allowed visitors, at least they're actively dying. So you can see their face and their eyes, how hope may have been taken away a little bit when you are having all of those conversations, wearing all this gear and, and they're alone. We have family on the phone sometimes by video, but I think missing the human touch has significantly affected those, those conversations that we unfortunately are comfortable with, but there is, they have switched to a point where patients are more isolated and yes, they have family at home, but they're facing the reality of, of death on their own. Well, what an what a interesting point of observation. I, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, the, the thing that actually hit me was our house staff um, miss us. So, so many attendings walking around the hospital all day long, we bounce into each other and uh, talk about patients and make rounds as a beehive and, and so forth. And now, as you probably saw, not only did you see the, the lonely patient who's worried and looking into your eyes and where's the family, but uh, how about your interaction with house staff? It must be so different, so fewer people around in the hospital room to room, floor to floor. So uh, one of the things that has, was difficult for me is we have a workroom in our, in our oncology floor. Yeah. And which, um, with, we have a hospitalist co-management team and we have nurse practitioners and pharmacy is a big team. And we have been deconstructed and I work for my office, my academic office. And then we pre-round over uh, a secure kind of video conference and, and then we kind of round on their own because you don't want to expose them. So I think it has changed the whole environment in which you felt like you had a team and now you kind of feel like I do have a team, but I don't see them. So I think it has been difficult uh, for the team as a whole. And I think for house staff, like especially interns in second years, I can imagine how do you feel about facing early mortality? Like when you and I trained, yes, it was difficult to be a first year resident, but it never crossed my mind that I may get sick and die while doing my job. Isn't that interesting and so true? And I'm at Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. And just as you suggest, we used to do the beehive rounds uh, all together. And so that's stopped. And we're trying to have one person see the patient, whether it be intern, resident, or attending, and then whoever didn't do just what you said, which is to telehealth. I like the video concept a lot. We don't do that enough because we got to see each other and, uh, and support each other. And so then we do our rounds um, outside the room, often not even in the hospital, just as you say, in, independent of that, um, on the telehealth and the video. You know, you mentioned we're <clears throat> facing our own mortality. So... I think I'm probably much senior to you. And I go back to, uh, well, in Philadelphia, we have Legionnaires. And I've intubated patients in the VA hospital not knowing what was the matter with them, except they seemed to have marched down Broad Street and were all Legionnaires. And then HIV came out. And while it seems ridiculous now, since it's such an ongoing, shouldn't die of it disease, we didn't know that back in the early 80s. And even one of my mentors said, you're not going to touch them, are you? And of course, as stupid as that sounds now, who knew? So this is this generation's similar problem, of course, on a huge, much grander scale. But nevertheless, you, you worry about the unknown, as you were saying to me earlier. How about if you could cover a bit the outpatient? Many of your patients as a thoracic oncologist are getting infusional therapy. How have you handled that? So I, I, we have patients that... Are, were enacted treatment. So we continue then enacted treatment. 
talking with them about risks and benefits and, and how comfortable they felt. I think for all new small cells, lung cancer, the answer is easy, like they need to start treatment. But I think for those patients that are in between, you know, the ones that are like, should you start or not? I, I think we have conversations with the patients and as a team. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have amazing patients that help make decisions with me. But it hasn't been easy because every time you decide to postpone therapy or to stop therapy, you're always wondering if you're doing the right thing. And you're trying to read more and more, thankfully, more and more data is coming out. But there is nothing to compare, right? In 1918, which is the last pandemic, we're still learning what cancer was. So I think it has been very difficult and there's a lot of back and forward. Some patients want to stop therapy and then, you know, they have the right to change their mind because we exactly don't know how long we're going to be in this new normal. Well, you raise such another interesting point. You made me aware of how the patient looks back at you in the inpatient setting and now here you're in the outpatient setting and they don't want to come in. Of course, we don't want them to come in less needed. And so everybody's afraid. Yet for the new patient, how long can you delay? And for the ongoing patient, maybe on second line, non-small cell lung cancer therapy, or even second line small cell, which I had a sad discussion this morning with a patient who's probably developed brain metastases, do they need to come in? Um, before we leave that, I'd love to take advantage of your expertise and, and you know, one day this world will return to normal, in medical oncology in particular. If you have a new metastatic non-small cell, let's say adenocarcinoma patient whose driving mutations you've checked and are negative, no, no mutation, how are you deciding on your first line therapy these days in your outpatient practice? Well, I, I think something that's ha- helping decide is unfortunately the pd one and we know the pd one is very heterogeneous and it can change from one side to the other. But due to the current pandemic and our patients with lung cancer tend to have a compromised lung function. Some of them may be former smokers, some of them may not be. But that has helped me determine if we we're going to go for first line only immunotherapy uh, understanding that if I put them in triple therapy, weak chemotherapy induced, their immune system will be more compromised and they may be at more risk for the infection. Yeah. Also, is I think the burden of disease and doing these telemedicine conferences are great, but also it's kind of hard to, you know, find out how much is the disease really affecting our patients' quality of life. Um, I, I like to see my patients walking to see how they get on the examination table. Mm-hmm. It's one of the tests that my grandpa, who was a doctor, told me. It's like, let them go to the examination table and see how they do. And we don't have that. So we're making decisions. We kind of have the information. So that's your in-room frailty test. Uh, what a nice uh, thought. <laughs> it's just had them get off the chair without family assistance and get on the table and lie down. Oh, yeah. My my grandpa told me that. And he also told me that um, ask them what they do in the weekend and they tell you how much energy they have Mm -hmm. when they're not forced to do daily activities. When there's their choice, you can decide how much your patient is really doing. Your grandfather was from Venezuela also? He was from Colombia and he practiced uh, for many, many years. He was uh, OBGYN and um, he had those little purse that he always explained to me. And Dr. Harry, now remind, like remembering my grandpa, I, I have to say that he used to say, when the hard times are coming, do not worry. Those will be great stories to tell medical students in the future. He always used to say that. I was like, don't worry, that's going to be a great story when you're teaching to the medical students. I think it's a wonderful, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm senior, way senior to you, and um, you never want to get a senior clinician at a dinner table with a bunch of younger doctors, because all we do is talk about, about yesteryear, but some of the time we're very interesting, so I, I couldn't agree with your grandfather more. Let me again take advantage of your expertise for our listeners. Um, the liquid biopsy as opposed to the biopsy, and, and when you're using that let's say in the new patient or the patient who's progressed on first line therapy, do you re-biopsy? Do you liquid biopsy? How do you pick your first and second line 
hearing those kinds of essays? Well, I think the first thing is for patients that have driver mutation, I especially EGFR, I tend to do a liquid biopsy first. And during the current pandemic, some of the companies that do liquid biopsy are actually going to my patient houses to draw well, the sample. Actually, I did hear that. Guardian 360, I got an email from them. They said they would go to the home. You're right. I heard that. Yeah. So I have done it in two occasions. It has been more than ideal, Dr. Henry, instead of bringing my patients to the hospital. They have gone there, and they're still running um, on time. I think as supplies are decreasing and they're being shifted to other areas, we may see more delays in next gene sequencing. And also the staff that kind of manages the gen next gene sequencing may get sick. Yeah. So uh, I still, tissue is still the preferred choice, but in the current pandemic, I think liquid bioxy has offered us auctions that we're not pos that you know they may not be possible in the pandemic because uh, long biopsies are they require quite some good amount of staff and planning and yeah. where our pulmonologists are busy trying to help the patients with the current infection. Um, I think liquid biopsy offers an alternative for patients with drought driver mutations it tends to be more difficult, uh, but we don't rebiopsy all the time in those patients if they have disease progression. Okay. And so before leaving this aspect of choosing therapy, is there a patient type you might say gets the immunoantibody only, perhaps pembrolizumab, or gets the full chemo antibody regimen, the three drugs? I think the three drugs is usually often used for patients that have a lot of symptoms because we, get, we can have a happier, faster, sorry, a faster response. Uh, compared to immunotherapy. So just this week, I had a patient that was having progressively worsening hemoptysis. Um, and some options were, tr were tried, but she needed to have a rapid response. So despite she having a higher pd one we needed to move forward. So we decided to, despite the outbreak, to use triple therapy. So I think the symptoms really help us determine which is the best choice for the patient. But if the patient is, has um, a, a disease that is not that symptomatic, a high pd one we may just proceed with immunotherapy only. And um, I think you may have just mentioned, so the pd one higher, it hedges your bet. So if it's 2%, okay, that's more than 1%, but if it's 50%, so you can help predict or in your, in your own approach, this is more or less likely to work. So you are folding that into your thought process, the PDO one percent Yeah, usually higher than 50%. That's how we tend to kind of break down the patients that we get monotherapy. Usually there's different schools and different uh, thoughts about PDO one because it's not 100% accurate, but I think it has help us in the current situation to kind of decide patients because the patients that get triple therapy, they also have to spend more time in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like they spend more time in the infusion table, um, the, the infusion chair. So that also takes into account. We are, I don't think we're making decisions and treatment in our current environment only based on one factor. Yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, how the patient feel comfortable, how far is the patient from the hospitals. Many of my patients live in rural Wisconsin, so we want to make sure they have access to whatever they need and decide the treatment uh, as well, because many of the infusion chairs have been, like the infusion center has been reduced in the amount of patients they can take. Okay. And, and before going to teaching, the last point I wanted to cover, two more questions on this, on the treatment. Um, Using the antibodies, the amino antibodies, are you seeing much side effect? I've seen a very severe pneumonitis. I've seen some severe diarrhea. Are you seeing that a lot, a little? What's your percent AE from these antibodies? So one of the things that my own research has shown and also my sample, many of my patients are women, is that women are most likely to develop certain immune-related adverse events. More than and, men. I'm sorry? More than, more than males, more than men. Yeah. Okay. Particularly certain adverse events like pneumonitis mm -hmm. uh, and um, endocrinology 
uh, kind of immune related adverse events like hypothyroidism, diabetes type one. So my sample is, you know, different because most of them are women and uh, they tend to have more of this adverse event. And many of my women are premenopausal, which on their own is a risk factor for immune related adverse events. Interesting. So, I think I have seen more because many more patients are going in monotherapy uh, compared to like some of the patients that we put in triple therapy. And I think something to, important to mention about these immune-related adverse events is that I'm being very cautious about steroids use. Um, I think more cautious than before, understanding that steroids will decrease cellular immunity in part, and they can put my patients at risk for the coronavirus. So it can negate your effect of the therapy and of course set you up for uh, the, the current problem epidemic COVID virus, okay. Yeah, so I think I've been more cautious, um, you know, for cutaneous issues, I think local therapy has been reinforced more than before. I think I'm being more and more careful and if the patient has an immune related adverse event, uh, we are also being going ahead and being very careful with them, doing close monitoring with the hope that they don't stay in the high dose steroids for a long time. Um, but there's a fine line between titrating the steroids very fast and getting rebound transaminitis, for example. So I think this is a new, a new era in which immune related adverse events need to be evaluated carefully all the causes need to be ruled out before we put the patients in steroids. No, I, I take your point because I've uh, been, of course, quick to tell patients if you develop one of these side effects of the antibodies, we have this, the, the antidote called steroids, so quick to go there. But I take your caution to all of us treating and seeing this to maybe not go to the steroids quite so fast or quite so high or taper so fast. So um, point taken. And then finally, before going to teaching, um, I had a patient just the other day, metastatic, non-small cell adenocarcinoma, had a cavitary lesion, and he's responding with his metastases elsewhere and said, listen, I want, I've heard so much about Avastin, Bevacizumab, I want to use that. I'm sure my cavitary lesion is better. Uh, can't you add that? Aren't you cautious, as we're warned, to watch out using this drug in such a patient? Would you agree I should still hold it and not use it? So the situation with cavitary lesions is that they have been excluded for all for the majority of clinical trials with Avastin. So the safety is is unknown. We know that these patients have high risk of hemoptysis, um, and that's what the initially prior to immune checkpoint inhibitors Avastin was only a, a proven no squamous cell. So I think if the patient is doing well and there's high risk. Uh, I would probably hold it because um, you don't know how safe it is. Mm -hmm. And if the patient starts bleeding, uh, it, it requires an intervention and that requires going to the hospital and probably a bronchoscopy and more. So I think risk over benefit if the patient is doing well, I think we stay away because we don't know how safe can be. And prior approval was only in a subgroup of patients, and those patients were not included. Very good point. Very good points. Um, finally, let's talk about teaching and how, in the current world, um, in this month of April 2020, during the epidemic, how are you teaching and interacting with either colleagues and tour boards or house staff? I'll tell you, yesterday I gave a, a noon lecture on myeloma, and I was using GoToMeeting, and actually I didn't use any slides or chalkboard, just they had the me picture of me the whole time talking and you can see who's at least on whether or not they're listening about 30 residents listening and the chief resident called me after and said we're so glad you didn't use slides and, and chug work because they never see you and they want to see that you're still alive and well so that was interesting <laughs> how are you <laughs> so for our audience i i still am uh am him here uh how are you teaching and what's how's the experience different for tumor boards or how staff teaching I think things quickly change. I, I usually have trainees in my clinic, and I remember getting an email around 5 p.m. saying all medical students are removing out of the clinics, yeah. out of the elective. But, and that was like, all right, this is a new, a new normal. And I'm, I'm concerned about how you're going to be able to help those medical students 
don't lose that clinical experience because what makes us good doctors is how good you're exposed to the clinical side of medicine. Yeah. Um, I, I have been teaching over the computer, like you say, WebEx or uh, Zoom. I think one of the good things about that is that there are people to record it. And many of them that are in heavy clinical duties right now, like for house staff, like the ICU or the general hospital, um, they're able to look at the recording later. So I think in the good, and the good thing is that they will be able to do that. Oh, such I, have, a good, yeah. I have also changed what I'm teaching a lot. I think usually I focus on mutations and lung cancer, but lately I have been focused on how to cope with some of the situations they're encountering. Um, because having a 20 year old or a 32 year old in the ICU was more like a rare finding. And now, unfortunately it's becoming a, a common thing. So, and that happens a lot to, to trainees. They can see themselves and patients. So a lot of my teaching has been focused on, on how to deal with all the things they're seeing, uh, how to educate their family as well, because their families are worried from them and many are, how staff and medical students don't have a family member that is in, in the healthcare workforce. So I have been focusing my teachings and teaching and helping them how to cope and also how to teach their families or what's going on. Because that medical student, that residence becomes the point person for that family to ask questions. So what if your grandma calls you and says that she wants to do this and she wants to go to church, but you're telling her, no, she shouldn't go. So that's what my teaching has been on, and mostly through soon. Um, so it has been a, a quick change from from an end track of mutations to how to talk to your family about coronavirus. Well, I think that's about your fourth or fifth pearl that you've taught me today that is really useful in terms of taking care of patients and ourselves and our trainees. So I really want to thank you, NJ, for joining us today on blood and cancer to talk about oncology, life in the new era, and in particular thoracic oncology, reminding our listeners that we are an online journal, mdh.com slash hematology dash oncology, where you can find us in archived podcasts. Show notes will be up today on our discussion with Dr. Duma in a few days. Our residents at Pennsylvania Hospital, a shout out to them for doing this. We have four budding hematologists, oncologists in the future who dutifully do this each week, and we really thank them very much. I've been speaking with Dr. Narjus Duma, who is a assistant professor of medicine at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where she is a thoracic oncologist. And NJ, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. A lot of good stuff. Thank you. And if I can say one last of thing course. is to um, all the attendants and all senior people, I think if we have 10 minutes, are we encouraged to call their mentees just to check on them? Not about papers, not about grants, just to make sure they're doing okay. I think that can, can go a long way. I think That's it goes a, ve a very long way. There's pearl number six. So th thank you so much. Really enjoyed speaking with you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Henry.